A graduate of McGill School of Medicine and Dalhousie University, where he studied history, Ewan Affleck has worked and lived in Northern Canada since 1992. In addition to his work as an acute care hospitalist in Yellowknife, Northwest Territories, he is currently serving as the Senior Medical Advisor, Health Informatics, for the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Alberta, Strategic Advisor, Clinical and Informatics at the Canadian Institute for Health Information, and Chair of the Alberta Virtual Care Working Group. He is the past Chief Medical Information Officer of the Northwest Territories, where they built the most digitally integrated system in Canada, with one charting system for all patients across all health professions. He was also co-chair of the National Virtual Care Task Force, served on the expert working group of the Pan-Canadian Health Data Strategy, and is the executive producer and co-writer of The Unforgotten in 2021, an award-winning film about inequities in health service for Indigenous peoples living in Canada. In 2013, he was appointed to the Order of Canada for his contribution to Northern Healthcare. We are looking forward, I'm sure it's along with you, to hearing Dr. Affleck's call to all of us to reimagine a new way of regulating the handling of health information in support of safer, higher quality delivery of health care services. Welcome, Dr. Affleck. Thanks so much for being here with us today. Thank you very much, Tracy and, and Michael. That's very kind. Um, I'm sitting here in Stanton Hospital in Yellowknife and there's some alarm going on. I'm actually on service this week, so a colleague is covering for me, but uh, hopefully they'll I don't know if you guys can hear it. There's an irritating buzz from some door or something down the hall. So thank you very kindly. Um, I, I much appreciate uh, the, the invitation. And I think how this is going to work is I will do my presentation and I think there'll be about 15 minutes or so, hopefully for for questions and, and discussion after. Um, so um, so let's get started. Um, I'm, I'm here in smoky Yellowknife. Unfortunately, you guys have been hearing a lot about this place on the news. This is a photograph of Yellowknife in the winter when, uh, and everyone's waiting here for winter to put out all the fires finally. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be invited to give this lecture. I, I don't claim in any way to be an ethicist per se. Uh, um, but uh, I looked up about John Dossiter. I had never met him, uh, uh, but uh, certainly a fascinating man who lived to the age of 96. And this is from his obituary that his family wrote. So uh, certainly he seemed to be a man from everything I read that, that, that uh, really was keen about and invited debate and, and of, of, as it says, debate on any and all subjects. Now, we don't have glasses of sherry right now, which apparently was his modus operandi from what his family wrote, but uh, maybe we can do that at another time. Um, I just want to, little disclosure, I, uh, Tracy mentioned some of these uh, affiliations I have. I, I don't believe I have any conflict of interest today. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge where I am. Um, so uh, Michael gave a land acknowledgement, but I'm actually on Treaty 8 territory, which is known as Chief Dry Geese Land. It's a traditional uh, home of the Yellowknife's Dene. This is a, a photograph of, of, of a river nearby, and this is from the, the Yellowknife Dene website. And uh, it's, it's a beauty. If you've never been up here, it's an absolutely beautiful place. Unfortunately, it's been ravaged by fire. Um, but um, it, I just want to acknowledge that. Um, so the Dossiter Health Ethics Center, um, you know, it endeavors to promote ethical engagement, mutual respect, critical reflection on matters of moral concern in healthcare. Uh, I, as I said, I'm not an ethicist, I'm a clinician and, and a health informatician. So I sort of play with with how we use health data in, in this in, in the domain of healthcare. But really what, what is of interest to me is, is this notion of, of a moral concern in healthcare. And I want to challenge that concept and, and, and ask if, if we are using health data, which sounds like a very dry and boring topic, although it's a little bit in the news and COVID has helped sort of promote the thinking or the work of some of us who've been playing in this domain for years. So really talk about, really ask the question, do we, 
um, are we using health data in a way that is a beneficial to Canadians, to individuals, populations, to to the, the country, to Albertans, um, or do we have a, a construct around this that might might require some reimagination, as Tracy said, because uh, there may be some moral pitfalls to how we are currently using data. So in this context, so ethics, you know, is defined here as, as the rationale behind our moral judgments, sort of what is right and wrong or just and unjust. And what particularly interests me and what I'm, I think I will get into or endeavor to here is, is really look at our human conduct, as it says here, um, and specifically our behavior we have around health data. So this is a, a, a definition that comes from Health Canada um, of ethics. I'm sure there are other definitions, but I thought that that was of interest that, that the government is defining this. And the government has defined other things specifically with respect to the healthcare system and health data. And one of those documents we're all familiar with, and this is the Canada Health Act. And Canada Health Act, I don't know how many people have read it, but I sort of look it over periodically. Um, uh, um, and, you know, it, it, it actually speaks principally to the universality and portability of health services through a fiscal lens, but it's not uniquely about um, financial arrangements to ensure that all Canadians get comprehensive um, uh, health service wherever they might happen to be. And so I will return to this, but certainly the Canada Health Act, and this is the this is from the mandate letter uh, to from uh, the the minister from the uh, Premier of Alberta in July to the new Minister of Health Adriana Lagrange. It states in it, it is also critical that these objectives. So mandate letters for those of you who are not initiated, sort of, are from uh, 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 the Premier or 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 the prime minister or whomever is in charge to their their ministers to say these are the objectives that you are to accomplish during your domain your your term in office and so it pins those objectives very clearly to the pillars of the Canada Health Act so i you know as much as there's disagreement sometimes about how healthcare is governed in Canada i think most people still try to adhere to the Canada Health Act. And we'll return to this towards the end of our chat here. So I like telling stories and I'm gonna tell stories about um, some patients. Um, some, and, and, and the, the first, first, there's really three main stories. The first two involve my practice. Um, and, um, and I just want to say, I received an email from someone uh, who asked me, uh, earlier in the week or last week, you know, I, I see the advertisement for this lecture. You're just going to be talking about data um, in relation to clinical healthcare services. And the answer is no, we will move beyond that. But I am starting sort of what I, with what I call the unit of care in Canada, uh, which is the patient. Um, and, and this is again, my sort of <laughs> place I hang out when I'm doing my clinical work. Um, but I think a lot of what I will say applies to other domains of health service, uh, including research and public and population health, so forth. So um, now it says here, I'm just going to say I should admit someone, so I'm going to admit them. I think I may be in control of this. So um, if, if I see that, I'll, I'll admit anyone who I'm desperate for friends, I'll admit anyone here. Um, so the first story took place in 1992, and it's this red dot here in Arctic, Quebec, in Nunavik. So I graduated from McGill, um, and I my first job was in this remote community on the Hudson Strait, and I was sort of an experiment. I was placed in a nursing station um, uh, to provide health service to basically the people along the the east the west coast the East Coast of Hudson Bay by phone and by medevac and, and by going in for community visits. It was a quite fascinating and wild job. So I had a, a, a little child brought to me in the nursing station where I was based who had been dropped. He was six weeks old and he had been dropped on his head. Um, and, 
and had uh, sustained bilateral, what we call cephalohematoma, so sort of basically goose eggs on his head. And um, so the, and he was very sleepy, like somnolent. The mother was very upset. And uh, so the question was, did, you know, what's going on here? We did an x-ray in, in nursing stations. The x-ray was done by the janitor who later went on to shoot a polar bear that came through town, by the way. And, and the janitor was a female also. So it was an interesting place to live. But uh, the, the um, x-ray showed these cracks or these lines in the skull that were very symmetrical. And for those of, for the uninitiated, you know, babies soon after they're born have sutures. And those, su those sutures, you know, allow the, the, the brain to, to um, um, the, not the brain, the skull to, to mold into the birth canal so that people can be delivered. Um, and so, um, the question I had, I'm looking at this thing, is this, are, are these sutures or these bilateral skull fractures? And the kid was not very uh, alert. And so bilateral skull fractures can cause, um, predispose you to, to bleeds in the brain, which can lead to death and so forth. So I evaluated this. What I did is I I, I, I copied this onto a piece of paper, the x-ray as best I could, and I faxed it to Montreal to be seen. And they laughed, they said I couldn't draw very well. The kid began to wake up. I, based on all the books I had, I figured that this was just probably um, sutures and that I was overcalling it. I kept the child, the child did fine, so forth, and I felt like a hero. You know, we send the x-rays out by twin otter and they come back two weeks later. It came back as bilateral skull fracture. So I had I was wrong. Fortunately, the child did not have a bleed, but it could have been a terrible situation. What this taught me is that the quality of care that I was providing was dependent on the on 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 the exchange of information. And I'd never really thought of that before. The the role information, which I consider contextualized data, and we're talking about data, uh, is 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 central to to all care. So fortunately, that worked out. The next story comes from a year ago, and it's it occurred just down the hall here. And this was a, a, a patient that was admitted, um, about 10 years younger than me, and um, myself and four other physicians, the eMERGE doc, the other hospitalist, the internist, and the um, uh, nephrologist were all involved in the care. We did not know a piece of information for 24 hours. We learned something 24 hours after they were admitted. It, we all agreed, including all these specialists on the course of therapy. Uh, 24 hours later, we all agreed we had to change our course of therapy when that information became apparent. And we rushed this individual uh, to the operating room, actually in Edmonton, we met back them and they died intraoperatively. They would have survived, I am certain, if we had known that information 24 hours before. So again, this drives home that if we don't have data or information that we need at the bedside when we require it, it can have catastrophic circumstance, uh, catastrophic um, results. So health and well-being then, based on these two stories, arise from quality care. Right. So if you're not providing quality care, uh, the health and well-being of individuals can be compromised and you need data as a core constituent of quality care in order to ensure the health and well-being of individuals. So if you look at this in another way, and this may seem simplistic or facile, but it's not something that we have necessarily considered or designed health systems to accommodate. So when there's a relationship between a provider and a patient, there is an exchange of information. That information comes in many forms. We listen to individuals, we take their history, uh, there's an exchange, uh, we examine them, you accrue information or data through that exam. We talk to specialties, specialists or, or other other individuals with specialized knowledge. We talk to the family. We have scheduling information, diagnostic imaging charts, lab DI, and clinical decision support tools like textbooks and online services. 
and those are all essential to us providing quality care. In the first case, what I was missing was the capacity to talk to a radiologist in Montreal who could have easily told me the answer to this story. I did not have the capacity to read that x-ray properly. In the second case, it was the information that was missing from the individual's chart for 24 hours that we discovered later because it had then been transcribed. So in both these situations, one, the outcome wasn't bad, but the other was cataclysmic. A, a loss of a form of information impacted the patient's health and well-being. What happens if you get rid of all health information? There is no care. So all, all health service is predicated on the analysis, the capture and analysis of health information. So, or said otherwise, data is the currency of all care. So we have a, a, an information industry or a data industry. And if we do not attend to the proper design and use of that data, then there can be terrible outcomes. As I said earlier, this is this, although I've used a clinical to a few clinical stories to illustrate that, the same can apply to population-based data. If you don't have coherent population-based data, you can run into problems. Canada performed very poorly around COVID. This is why the government launched the Pan-Canadian Health Data Strategy, on which I was a member. And we came out with three reports about how to improve our data use in Canada. Um, and the same for research, the same for health administrations, the same for the capacity of the government. And I'm doing some work for Health Canada now. Like all the, all the efforts around the health workforce now, governments are lacking data on the health workforce. And so the crisis we have now is a problem. And if you do not have data, you will make probably bad decisions or uninformed decisions. And the same with health innovation. So this applies to all of these domains. So what is then the relationship? Uh, let's dig into this relationship between health data and the purpose of healthcare. So the purpose of healthcare, as I've stated before, is the, the provision of quality health programs and services, or on a clinical basis, quality care. We are not in this business, whether you're a researcher, whether you're government, whether you're an administrator, whether you're a population or public health individual, we're not in the business of providing shitty service and damaging people. Last time I checked, we all have a common uh, obligation, fiduciary obligation to provide quality care or quality programs and services. And I define these, and there are many definitions of quality, but I define these based on the grandmother of all definitions, which came from the Academy of Medicine, uh, the National Academy of Medicine in the United States, formerly the Institute of Medicine. And they define it as safe, effective, efficient, equitable, timely, and person-centric care. We, sh we do not want to, whether you're a researcher or, or a clinician or whatever, uh, provide results from our research or care that is unsafe and damages people. We want it to be effective. We want it to be efficient and not wasteful. We don't have endless resources. We want there to be health equity in all the work we do. We want it to be timely and we want it to be centered on our fundamental accountability to Canadians, to the individual to, to the person. So I'm gonna tell the third story then. So let's look at how we are doing with respect to this. And we're gonna sort of dig into this notion of, of how we're using data in order to justify um, an approach perhaps to reimagining this. So I don't know if anyone recognizes this individual and I'd love to be talking to you in person, wandering around the room, but he's an Albertan. He died 11 years ago. His name is Greg Price, and his family have been very active uh, advocating for, for system reform in the healthcare uh, sector since his death. And the Health Quality Council of Alberta did a report, which you see there, on his death. I work closely with, the, with, the, with Terry and Dave, his father and sister. And uh, Greg Price is... is unfortunately is is uh, the the only canadian thus far i think to have his death ascribed to mismanagement of his health information largely because we don't 
evaluate that or look. Um, so let's see what happened to him. So he died in 2012. And his story started 407 days before when he went to a clinic for a simple little issue. And I won't get into the, the entire story. And this was followed by a visit to another clinic. And then over the course of 407 days, he had many visits to many clinics and services. In total, there were 11 different, uh, 12, pardon me, 12 different health services involved in his care. And each of these health services uh, had an individual database. So these circles are individual database. So his data was held by the emergency room, by the clinic one, by the general surgeon, clinic two, surgery, prostate clinic, so forth. It was held uh, in different databases. The only exception were the two labs because NetCare existed in Alberta then. So they had a shared viewer uh, that all the labs fed into. Greg himself had no access to his health information. We now have some portals in Alberta, but they didn't exist then. So each of the, as I've said, each of these clinics had an individual database and they had technology that held that data. And that technology may have been a computer, it may have been paper, it was a variety of different um, uh, technologies at that point in time. And so the, the, let's, let's define something here, technical factor interoperability. The ability of these different databases to communicate is called technical factor interoperability. And it's about data content standards, uh, data, um, data uh, exchange standards, and, and other stuff like that. And in fact, there were 12, as I said, 12 different databases in, in Greg's care. And the arrows that you see are instances of exchange of information between the different databases. So I don't know about you, but I don't know if this looks like a, like a fairly um, clean sort of way to manage someone's care, but it looks a little chaotic to me. And in fact, um, there were all kinds of problems with the exchange of information that led to uh, many of the concerns and ultimately to his death. So technical and factor interoperability, as I've said, is data content standards, data exchange standards, so forth. We don't really need to go into that. Um, so what's the impact then of such a fragmented data environment? What was the impact on him? Um, so let's look at this through the lens of harm. Does this environment in which he was cared for result in harm? So this is work I'm doing with my group and we have, we have broken, we, we, we are defining, and a paper is coming out soon on data related harm. There to our knowledge, and I'm working with a colleague of the European Union and elsewhere on this, there is not a, an international, or it's not a framework for data-related harm that we know of. So we, we ascribe three levels, individual harm, population harm, and system harm. And if you ask about harm arising from health data, most people immediately think of breaches of personal privacy and security. And in fact, if you ask ChatGPT, what data-related harm is, and ChatGPT is great in so far as it reflects sort of cultural norms. It is not necessarily reflective of truth, but it reflects cultural norms, and it largely talks about um, personal privacy and security. Our group suggests there are other forms of harm, physical and emotional damage, and I've gone through three cases with Greg Price and, and my two earlier cases where people were potentially damaged or died because of misuse of data. Breach of cultural rights in Canada, we have nation to nation relationships uh, with, with indigenous peoples and they are, uh, they're entitled to, to data and there's, the, there's OCAS and, o, pardon me, OCAP, um, if you're not familiar with the Métis and, and First Nations and the Inuit also have uh, a data sovereignty um, principles. There's breach of legal and ethical rights. The Supreme Court of Canada decided 31 years ago that we all should have access or at least ownership. It's a little vague. I've asked constitutional lawyers about this. Um, um, about whether we own the data or not, but certainly it is our data. Uh, our health information, according to the Supreme Court. 
There's population-based harm, failure to benefit from science and use data for public good. Are we doing research? Do we have data to do research? Data to make informed population and public health. If we don't, we can damage people or, or fail to learn from, from and, and inform healthcare and population-based health in a way that is beneficial to people. Use of data to promote population-based discrimination and inequities. It's probably not a big thing in Canada right now, but it does happen, certainly with other forms of data. And then there's system harm, cost overruns and system inefficiency. Canada Health InfoA suggests that if we had comprehensive health data interoperability in Canada, we would save billions of dollars. Harm to the health workforce. And I can tell you, after my patient died here, uh, in 2022, I felt like quitting. It is hard to work in an environment where you are not confident you have all the information to do your job. I and my colleagues certainly didn't sign up for this to damage people. And if we do not have the information or do not know it even exists or where to get it, and so a lot of us are not terribly confident in with the information systems that we're working with, and that is a huge problem. And the literature on this suggest that harm work uh, harm is certainly a byproduct often of digital health systems. And then failure to support innovation. Data is the lifeblood of, of digital health innovation and, and it's a real problem. Just meeting with, with some AI experts who are exceedingly frustrated with their capacity to do their work because they can't get data. So, you know, what happened with Greg? Well, he died and, and as the Health Quality Council of Alberta said, physical and emotional damage occurred. Um, it was a breach of his rights. He really couldn't, legal rights, get access to his information at that point in time, even though it was 20 years after the Supreme Court of Canada's decision. And certainly this is not an efficient way to care for people with all the chaos of the information. And if you read the report from the Health Quality Council, there was lots of chaos. And certainly the people that were involved in this care that that probably felt terrible as I have in, in my instances, and there was probably harm to them uh, in terms of their, their health and well being as providers. So, how did this happen? So, what are the determinants of this? How did we create this environment that, 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 that we've mapped here, this health information exchange map for Greg Price? Um, so let's look at some factors. Governance, who's in charge of the health data in this situation? The answer is quite simple, no one. No one's in charge of health data in most jurisdictions in Canada. The health data is actually under the custodianship of custodians, uh, under, under, the, uh, under the oversight of healthcare custodians and that's legislated in health information acts. So the legislation around health data very effectively fragments every individual's health data between different services. So as I like to say, health data is legislated to be fragmented in Canada very successfully. And, uh, and that fragmentation, I would suggest, leads to harm. So you could say the current legislative framework is harming Canadians. Regulation, who is regulating the, the, the conformance of technology well, there is no interoperability legislation to begin with, which is another issue, and there's no one regulating it because the legislation doesn't occur. We largely just regulate um, uh, around uh, privacy and security, and, and certainly there is robust privacy and security legislation. Who is ensuring the workforce competency, the people designing these health systems? It's an unregulated profession. There is no one in charge, no one, anyone can put up a shingle and say, I'm designing health systems for this consultant and so forth and so on. It's an unregulated uh, uh, profession. Data literacy is the workforce. Are we literate about what is happening? Do we talk about it? Are is the professionals? the health professionals, um, and I'm working currently with the U of A, with the Faculty of Medicine working on, and with Toronto Metropolitan University, looking at curricular change to begin addressing these shortfalls. There was a report that came out in 2012 from Canada Health InfoA and uh, the AFMC, this, the Federation of Medical Colleges of Canada, saying there's an urgent need to update the curricular content. This has not happened yet. 
uh, 11 years later. Is the public aware of how their data is used? Are they literate about it, the danger of this? I, I really don't think so. Uh, most are not, and most people think their data is shared until they become ill, shared coherently. Do we communicate about this issue? Not really, I don't believe, because we haven't really identified it as a problem. And is there a culture of trust uh, in the healthcare system for sharing data? Often not, and certainly different. There's fragmentation across different provinces and territories and different custodians. So there's a lot, there's a sort of imperative, negative imperative not to share data. And we really have a culture of, of, of service centricity, not patient or person centricity. So really, when you look at many of these factors, they, they don't really, you know, we asked how Greg's environment came to be. Well, if you begin looking at the determinants of this environment, let alone that there's not technical factor interoperability, we've got a bit of a problem. So I call these human factor interoperability. And um, again, coming out with a paper on this uh, in January in Longwoods. And human factor interoperability, I would suggest, is largely a determinant of technical factor interoperability, okay? So how we govern, how we regulate, how we legislate around data. Because if you look at technical factor interoperability in Canada, Canada Health Infoe and many others are, have been trying to promote this for years. The solutions exist, they just simply haven't been adopted and scaled. So the question is why? Denmark proceeded down the road of, of technical factor and human factor interoperability 29 years ago. The United States, 19 years ago. In May of this year, we came out with a report, Canada Health Infoway, suggesting that we cooperate around this. So really, we've been largely looking, uh, concentrating on technical factor interoperability at the expense of considering how we as individuals interact around data. And that is a huge problem. And so this is really the relationship between human factor and technical factors. And if you don't get governance, regulation, literacy, culture, communication, and legislation right, you're going to have a lot of trouble getting the technical factors aligned. And you know the legislation we currently have around health data was was large. It's largely analog legislation. It's built for a an analog paper based environment. It does not work currently. So let's bring this all together. Um, so as we recall, I suggested to you that data is the currency of all care. If we do not use data properly, we can damage Canadians. So quality health programs and services, that is our accountability. I don't think anyone, whether we're in health government, whether we're a clinician, et cetera, et cetera, all of us, that is our collective accountability. We've looked at human factor and technical factor that determine whether interoperability exists. And there are other factors than, than interoperability in, in, that, that determine how data can be designed and used, but it's really the, a, a foundational determinant of our capacity to use data. And I've, that's why I've chosen to concentrate on it. And then we have health data related harm. Our job then is to design interoperable data in a way that maximizes quality and minimizes the harm, right? So have we done that? Well, my discourse probably suggests to you we are not doing that very well, and we're not. And if you look, for instance, as legislation as one of the human determinants or human factors in interoperability, we largely focus on one form of harm breach of personal privacy and security. In fact, health information acts are often called privacy legislation. People refer to it, and I'm, I have people, we just wrote another paper, said, well, why don't you just call it the privacy legislation? Largely focuses on privacy. Now, don't get me wrong, privacy is deeply important. I'm not running around saying privacy and security are, are our problem are not a problem. They are, they're very important. We want to ensure the privacy and security of people's health information, but not, not at the expense of other forms of harm. 
and not in isolation, not without even acknowledging often these other forms of harm. So let's just stop there for a moment. And I'm going to give an example. And, and people say, well, the private, the, the, the current Health Information Act in Alberta, and, and there are many versions of this in different jurisdictions. There's also federal legislation if certain jurisdictions don't have a Health Information Act. It's permissive of the sharing of health data. It is. They are. It is. It says it. Often the problem is a matter of interpretation by given custodians about that. But permissibility, so it says you sh you need to protect privacy and security, but you can absolutely share information for the benefit of patients. I'm just, this is simplifying things. But it's it's like saying if if you can stop at a red light, but you don't really have to. So we do not have to share information. There's no consequences if we don't or health information, vendor technology do not have to make their systems interoperable. So if we choose not to, to share information, that's that's cool. It's like saying you can go through red lights if you want, may, you may kill someone, but there's no consequences. But we recommend you probably should stop. I would suggest that that's probably not a good way to proceed. If we can identify, and the literature supports it, that we're damaging people through not coherently sharing information for all the purposes I've outlined, then we should probably think about how we go about ensuring that occurs. And if you look at, and this involves changing our mental model, because we seem to have an obsession with certain forms of harm and ignore others. You look at this, this is sort of a mental model test the lines all look crooked to all of us. We know they're straight, but they're, they're, they, they just look crooked. We have an obsession with certain forms of harm at the expense of others. So I like to challenge that mental model. And again, I've made clear that I support 100% the important role of privacy commissioners and the privacy and security of people's information. But we need to reconsider all the other forms of harm. So I say this, I make this statement um, ironically, based on what's happened, um, to challenge people's mental model. When I kill you because I do not have access to your information, at least it will be a private death. But unfortunately, that's a, that's a bit of a descriptor of the situation we currently have. And I am in no way vilifying privacy. We need a nuanced balance to all of this. So, Let's look at just, uh, you know, we're, I'm nearing the end here, a few more minutes. So we have our model of, of accountability to minimize harm and maximize quality in our factors. And we've seen that the sharing of health information per, for the purpose of quality care is essential. We've contextualized this in, in terms of the two stories. The first story, I couldn't share information. The second story, information was missing. Um, and the impact of custodial legislation on the fragmentation of our care. This is actually, and I've made reference to this, each then province and territory. So, so health data is fragmented within jurisdictions on a custodial basis. No one is really in charge. Your health data is fragmented between different custodians. No one really is ensuring that these custodians design health data systems in a way that consolidates your information so that you are well and safe. And then we do this 13 different times in Canada. And forgotten in all of this is, is the patient. I mean, if you look at quality care, the unit of care is the individual. We should be designing information not around ourselves or our jurisdictions or our health services. The, the, the unit that this information needs to follow is the individual. And we can do this. It's entirely possible digitally. We just don't. Why? I don't know. We never have. We have a service-centric and jurisdiction-centric culture of care. You know, so I told you we'd go back to the Canada Health Act. So the Canada Health Act states that continued access to quality health care, there it is, that's our ultimate accountability, 
without financial or other barriers. And I said, it speaks to financial issues, but other issues as well will be critical to maintaining the health and well-being of Canadians. Absolutely. So what are those other barriers? Well, our work at the Pan-Canadian Health Data Strategy, we were very clear. One of those barriers is health data. And we actually looked at the Canada Health Plan. Failure to collab collaborate across Canada to build a learning system, to learn from the data, right? Um, will risk continual escalation of care costs, underperformance of health services, poor health outcomes, including avoidable illness and death low levels of innovation, perpetuation of health inequities, and ineffective responses to future public health threats. So there you go. That sort of summarizes what I've just been saying. If we do not use data, we will fail and harm people. And this is this panel of experts from across the country for the producers for Public Health Agency and, and, and Health Canada. So if we go back to the Canada Health Act, understanding that improvements in health will require cooperative partnership of governments, health professionals, voluntary organizations, and Canadians. Do we have a history of cooperating on health data? Not really. We largely do it on a jurisdictional or, uh, or custodial basis or service basis. We can't do this anymore. We have to cooperate. But this has not really been in our genes terribly well. And then the Supreme Court of Canada, and I made reference to this, states, this data really belongs to each individual Canadian. Do we honor that? Currently, about 34% of Canadians through portals have access to some of their information. That's data, just new data from the Canada Health InfoWay. This is 31 years after the Supreme Court of Canada decided that we're just still under a third of Canadians having access to the information which is theirs. That's a problem. And this is where our mental model and our entire approach is failing Canadians because it's their information, it's our information, and we're harming each other. And not only are we harming individuals, we're harming governance, we're harming professions, we're harming each other. And that's the way we have to look at it. Why are we harming each other through our design and use of data? I don't know. The beauty of this is that the glass is half full. We can all benefit by reimagining this, all of us. Great, when does that happen that everyone benefits, right? So if you look back at, at the definition of ethics, justification for our judgments, what is morally right and wrong, I would suggest <laughs> sort of immoral what is happening. I, I don't think, and based on what the Canada Health Act and everyone else is saying, I don't think, we signed up for this collectively to damage each other, did we? To harm each other, right? But our behavior, as a second statement, is very strange. It's odd that we are doing so and perpetuating this. So we need a common destination. I'll be very brief here. You know, you know, I, I sort of highlighted privacy, and again, I feel it's important. But here, the Privacy Commissioners of Canada urging recently a pan-Canadian health data charter as a reasonable point for a common destination. Can we all agree on principles of system design? Well, they did this based on the work of the pan-Canadian health data strategy. We developed a charter that we're encouraging everyone to look at. And it's based on the universal human rights to health, <laughs> to not be harmed, to benefit from science, research, population health, all that, innovation, non-discrimination and equity. So we, we built 10 principles and we're asking each province and territory and organization to endorse these. And there's, I can distribute this. Um, this came out a year and a half ago. And to do so, the only thing stopping us from doing this is cooperation. As the Canada Health Act says, we should be doing cooperating. There's nothing stopping this because we're all gonna benefit. If we don't, there'll be more grade prices. We will continue to damage people Right. So thank you very much. I think I was supposed to stop. I went a minute or two over. Um, thank you very much. This, again, is the beautiful land I'm on. I will stop there and um, turn it back 